Welcome to Straight Talk with Supply Chain Insights. My name is Laura Ciceri. I'm the founder of Supply Chain Insights, and I bring you this podcast each week, connecting business leaders to business leaders to drive differentiation. This is part of a podcast series where we're asking first-generation supply chain pioneers to share their insights on their careers to help those that want to enter the supply chain profession. Today, I'm interviewing Philippe Lombard, and Philippe is the Vice President of Logistics and Field Operations for a really fun company called Tonal, which is, you know, this whole new development in equipment to help us improve our physical fitness. Philippe, welcome to the show. Hello, Laura. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, tell the group a little bit about yourself. Thank you. So my name is is Philippe, as I said, and uh, originally coming from Belgium, as you can hear from my accent. I've been working in many countries overall, five different countries, worked in 38 countries as a professional in supply chain. And basically, I've I've had different industry uh, experience, but Basically, the beginning of my career was with large company like Procter & Gamble, where I started my career in Germany as a manufacturing engineer. And then I moved to Kraft Foods, where I had a fairly long career of about 21 years, 21 years of career, moving through many different uh, positions in supply chain, in IT, strategy, and sales. And I, I finished where in 2011, where I was senior vice president of global planning and global logistics and customer service at Kraft Food based in Chicago. From there, I had a stint, a first of two stints in pharmaceutical industry. The first one was Merck in uh, New Jersey, where I was responsible for a senior vice president of global supply chain management. After Merck, I moved back to the West Coast in Los Angeles, where I was global head of logistics and planning with Mattel, very different type of industry in toy industry and uh, more likely with fashion, then moved back to the East Coast, where for the last three years, I was with Johnson & Johnson, and I was head of planning, global planning, for their $10 billion medical device in orthopedics. And as you mentioned, I'm speaking to you from the last three, four months now. I've been with Tonal, which is a startup in California, very different in the artificial intelligence uh, space. So very different type of industry, very different type of location. I'm very happy to share any experience I can to your audience here today. Well, just such a wonderful wealth of experience, both in terms of domain expertise, different companies, different industries, different geographies. Walk me through your career choices. How did you make the choice? Did you have like a fixed path that you wanted to go down or how did you make those choices? Right. So I I wish when you look back in all those, what is now 30 years, you look back and you say, well, it looks pretty straightforward, many industry, many different positions. The the reality is you first at the beginning, you look for companies that you know, cultures that you like in experience that are new and exciting to you. So the the reality is, as I moved around, I had the chance to go for a great company, but the reality, they were not always very clear choice or very articulate. I just liked the company I was working with or looked to, and I just thought it would be fun to work for them. So what's come to my mind is you have to go and, and think about fun as work because you know, I've had time in my career where I got to work and it wasn't fun and that was time to move on. But that's priority number one. Then obviously you have to learn, you have to go and say, did I do this? And every time you go to a new area in the supply chain, a new location, a new geography, a new product, it's all type of dimension that makes you, I believe, richer. And so in Kraft Foods, when we had this motto, if you wanted to be an executive supply chain leader, you needed to have two categories, two product categories. You needed to do two geographies and two different type of of business units. And so that would give you the the maximum amount of of degree. And I would say I tried to follow that where I've done at some point in my career, I had period where it looked to be different, but reality, I was doing more of the same. So my advice to everyone that listens to us is is try as much as possible to go and learn 
and do something different in all the part of your supply chain, which was what happened to me. One of the themes that I, I discover pretty soon is I like something new. I, I like experiencing and building new things. In my career at Kraft Foods, although it's a fairly large company, it ended up being a $50 billion dollar, dollar company before the split. The reality, I worked from the ground up in very small business unit at the beginning, creating a global supply chain. And frankly, that, that's this type of spirit that, that is interesting me to work for Tono because it's all about scale up and all about starting something. And, and that's why you need to, to know is, are, are you, do you like those type of circumstances? And throughout my career, I, I did. And throughout my career, most of the roles I had did not exist before I had the role. The role was newly created or I created it and I applied to it. And so I, I would say I would advise your audience to think about, you know, knowing themselves and learning about themselves like I did throughout my career. Well, Philippe, you've had a wealth of experience and, you know, I've often heard you say, you know, build that wide experience set and learn in the first part of your career. How did you learn? So uh, again, it, it's, it's learning by, by doing, right? Being, being a look at, at mentor, being make sure that you've got enough visibility and, and you've got a, a good sense of a broad picture. Procter and Gamble in such was a great experience in terms of, you know, very mature processes, very mature structure, you learn a lot, and that's where you know how the target should be in a, in a large company. And that gives you a template, I would say. So that, that's how I learned to really learn from, from those kind of, of great practice. One of the themes that are also from a learning point of view dear to me is a, I would call a T model. A T model, think about, you know, the, the top of the T is about getting as many experience as you can across the supply chain again. And I went from procurement all the way to being in sales. And you don't need to be an expert at everything, but I, I do believe being part of those different groups gives you a unique perspective that is always different. You know, definitely my passion, as you know, Laura, is really about the customer. So being, being working with the customer and facing the customer and doing something and providing value for the customer. But then the, the branch of the T is all about deep, right? It's all about depths. So I would say my depths has been in logistics and, and in planning, where I, I developed, came from an IT point of view, and, and then continued to have different role in different category, different geography, different product. And that T, I think, gives you an anchor, right? And one of the examples I think we were discussing before getting on this call was one of the, the main T I had and you will recognize if you hear this, was, you know, one of the companies I work with, very specialized in manufacturing. And we had a career chat one day, and he said, look, I, I really want to become a VP. I want to become an executive supply chain leader. And I told him, look, you're great at manufacturing, but you've done manufacturing for 12 years. You've got to learn something different, not from a manufacturing standpoint. You've got to jump in a, in a different area. And the reality, he jumped into a role in logistics that got him passion for the customer, that gave him a passion for retail. And that person is now the executive vice president of a very large retailer. And that's the type of opportunity he wouldn't have had if he had stayed within his own expertise box of being a manufacturing leader. Fascinating, isn't it? Because sometimes people that are entering the profession want to go really deep and short cycle the learning process. But I think we've got to learn first before we go and really build that kind of expertise. Tell me, Philippe, you've been a leader across Kraft, Merck, Mattel, J&J, &J, very different organizations. How did you enter those organizations as a senior leader and how do you onboard teams? So first of all, you, you've got us, you got into a, a company, especially those type of large company, but I would say it's valid with any company. You've got to listen, number one. Now, people will give you different mandate, but you have to listen and learn how things are being done with a positive tilt, knowing that despite the fact that you may say there is tons of things that don't work or could be improved, 
that you have to start to understand the historical background and the current state. Otherwise, you will start from jumping the gun. And especially in case where I've been involved, where there is a lot of tribal knowledge, you will miss a step. So I would say getting used to understand, making sure that as you get into a company, you tell the people and you you confirm what you're hearing and what you're seeing. The more senior you is, you are, the more important that step is going to be, is critical to get into a, a company. Then onboarding to your question, is, I think it's about, you know, one thing I did not mention is, is really I like company with purpose. Everybody does, but I've been in company which had less purpose or less value or were living by less the value they had on their PowerPoint than some others. And I would say onboarding is important versus where the company is from a value point of view and, and its purpose. And as you onboard, you, you make sure that people meet the different level of, of people from senior all the way to junior people, that they have a good sense of who they are going to work with. Make sure that when you onboard in your first three months, that what you have is actually one thing that you will never have after your first 90 days is management attention. When you're new, people know that you're new. They want to bring you on board. So you've got to maximize the management attention and talk to as many people as you can in your first 90 days to make sure you get a sense, a very good sense of where the company is, what people want, what the priorities are. And once you have that, I think you have a very good foundation. So this would be the the kind of core principle of getting a a good onboarding, which I've had in a few cases. But it's it's very often, this is a rare, rare, uh, not always a a capability that every company has, unfortunately. So Philippe, you're a great listener. And you not only listen for what is said, but for understanding. And if someone listening to this has a new boss that you know is coming on and trying to learn the organization, what advice would you have for them? Because you actually entered many organizations at a senior level, and those were very different supply chains with different legacy. What advice would you have for people that are onboarding a new leader? I would say you know, you've, you've got to listen on both sides. So uh, if you're hiring, if your question is about you've got a new leader, how do you make sure that that new leader uh, comes in and understand? You've got to give them the sense of the challenges and the opportunity. And you've got to be very clear on what could be done and what you need and what you could do if you had the means to do it. And so I would say, you know, giving that new boss a very clear sense of the current state again, tell it without negativity, but with very clear fact base is very important. And and very often I found that when people have even a role of responsibility, they're not always good at explaining what they do and what the dimension of what they do is and how the impact, how what they do impacts the bottom line or provides outcome in the company. And so this is, I would, I would really advise you to have for anybody who's listening, it's almost like, a, a, like you have a resume, right? You, you need to have a presentation always ready that you update. And I've done that many, many times in my career, where if somebody stops me and say, can you give me a, an overview of what you do? I can do it within you know, a, a given amount of time with the dimension that give them a very clear sense of what I'm doing and what they can count on me first. That would be very important. Yeah, I used to track statistics around, you know, how I was doing against plan or what the issues were, because I find that people have a data driven kind of slide deck in their back pocket. It's a lot easier to help a new manager or someone who's trying to understand the function. Exactly. I mean, just even know your number, right? Right. What are, you know, what's your revenue? People have a sense, but you know, people say, I manage the budget of X. Okay, what's what's the budget? You know, I uh, manage customer service. Okay, how many order per year do we have? How many customer order? How many reward do we have? And that gives you a sense of, you know, your number. That's an advice and an ask I always had from my team that my, my leader, my boss before, you have to know your number. 
Right. You have to know your number, own your number and be accountable for your number. Right. Exactly. And also, I think you've got to be accountable to your team. Let's talk about interpersonal skills. When you think about onboarding a person and managing a person interpersonally, what are the skills that you think people need to develop? Well, that sense of, you know, personal relationship or being being uh, feeling that you're seeing it from other people's corner. I mean, the notion of inclusion goes much broader than just, you know, gender and, and race and, and, and sexual identity. It's really about, are you able to see things my way from my perspective, even if you're completely coming from a different angle? So I would say, and it's especially important, right, as we all interact through Zoom and, and, and virtually right now in the last 18 months, is making sure that you listen and you understand what's, what's important and what's bothering and what's motivating the person you talk to. That's true as a leader and that's true as a manager. You know, you have to put yourself in the shoes of, of your manager and say, what, what does she or he motivate? What, what, why is she or he stressed out? What is going to drive them, you know, attention? What, what are their own objectives? If I were in their shoes, what would I need from me? And the reverse is have a, a supportive also a servant leadership, which is always important, right? You know, we talked about, we both come from many years ago where the sense of management was very often very top down. It doesn't work this way. So you have to be there for your people. You have to help them and you have to be able to develop them and, and make sure that they are there for you. And so very often the way you develop them is, is uh, you know, coaching, being able to ask the right question, make sure that you don't give them the answer, but you give them through your question the possibility to actually learn themselves doing the journey you want them to do. That's a great gift, the insight you've given there. Thank you. Now, any other piece of advice that you would share with people entering the career? Well, I, I talked to you, you mentioned about multiple industry. One of the themes is, is two themes, that notion of multi-industry and the notion of customer, right? The, the, the notion of, of multi-industry, what, what I live through and through, I talked to you about Mattel, which was fashion, uh, craft foods. I worked in all kinds of product from fresh cheese, 15-day shelf life to product that, that had two-year shelf life you know, pharmaceutical industry, vaccine, all of those have fantastic learning. The principle of the supply chain very often are the same. What is a good inventory management? Was it good manufacturing, Lean Six Sigma? Those problems are very often similar and they are a common toolkit. But at the same time, you learn so much culturally. I cannot advise more than for, for people to work through multiple companies. And you know, sometimes I see too many, too many people that have a one single view on, on the same industry and go from one company to another. I mean, the reality, you know, many of the company take it Kraft Food, Mondelez, Campbell Soup, etc., are competitor, but they are broadly the same working in the same industry. And you will learn less from going from one to another than, than just by changing industry. Number one. Number two. Think about the customer. I, I, you know, very often, you know, it's all about the customer, whoever that customer is. And I would say, make sure that, you know, what you do, you know, we often talk about data analysis, you know, deep data, uh, who, who is going to use what you do? Who is the internal customer, but most of all, the external customer of everything you do. And I found a lot of motivation and, and helping me to focus about, if it doesn't matter to the customer, should it matter to me? It's really also has been a, a big anchor for me. So, Philippe, I teach a lot of workshops. And one of the things I do is have people draw the supply chain. And in my experience, I've only had one person draw the supply chain and include the customer. And one of the things that I think makes you great is that you really start with the customer. Why do you think... Others don't. I don't think it's intended. 
but I think you have to be in a situation where what you thought was very, very important to you and what you thought was very important to your customer couldn't, couldn't be of the least importance to the customer. Right. And I've been in those aha moments in consumer good or in pharmaceutical to say, boy, I, I thought you care about that and, and it would matter to you. And they're like, you know, if, if, you, if you could have called me, if you could have discussed, I could have changed those specifications you're working so hard against. On the other hand, you're not talking to me about this thing, which really is huge to me. And again, as it, it's all a paradigm, right? It's back to what we said about the people and, and how do we interact is, is the customer puts you in front of what matters. Now, I, I want to be clear, the customer is not always right in the sense of it doesn't mean always answering whichever customer wants, right? And we this is, we could discuss for hour, but it, it does tell you who who you have in front of you and, and how do you want to react to that customer. So the notion of choosing your response is, is very important. And you may disregard what the customer says because it's not going to be good for you, or it may actually help you. But every time I found starting with the customer first in that page is, is always put me into, you know, to, to really focus on what matters. Again, I think you've got to be a good listener and you've got to go in with an open mind about really understanding the customer and putting yourself in their shoes. Right on. Well, Philippe, it's wonderful to have you on the show today. Uh, I love your insight and wisdom. I think you've got some of the best breath. And I love the fact that you're an innovator and you challenge the industry. But I also love the fact that you've been very active in industry consortia and trying to move the industry forward. Any piece of advice there about managing the career and working with industry groups? Again, I think that working with industry group, working with other company is, is something that I, I found extremely rewarding. As you know, I've been in the board of GS1 for many, many years as a multiple industry. And again, choosing what, what makes the difference for all our company. Sometimes some of those problems can only be solved by everybody working together, not as competitor. And I think that that again gave me a sense of humility about you know, some of the problem statement and got knows from global warming, you know, to many others, we have many common things that we have to work together on. I think working for the industry, helping the industry to show the way when you have a, a position of leadership, I think has been incredibly rewarding. And I would advise everybody to do that if you, if you have the opportunity. Awesome. Well, Philippe, thanks for joining the show today. As always, it's great to hear your voice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Great day.